I'm going to do my my I'm going to do my 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 recognition already. <laughs> I don't know if you have heard that. I, I, I saw a message on the chat that you didn't hear that. Anyhow, it was a song by um, Pink Floyd back maybe 50 years ago. And, um, and this is a song uh, uh, titled Time uh, from the very famous LP called uh, The Dark Side of the Moon. It is one of the best selling uh, long planes ever in the history of music, of pop music. And it is interesting because we are going to talk about time. Sorry, we are going to talk about time. And also it happens that uh, this evening I'm going to attend a, con a concert by Roger Waters, uh, who was the bass from Pink Floyd and he's performing here in Madrid. So I have to, this is why I asked to have the, the presentation by now because by seven-ish so I have to leave it to attend that other Possibly more entertaining event than the one <laughs> I'm delivering you here, but but so that was like, that came to me as a connection, and then that's what I wanted to, to put that music, uh, just the beginning of the song, and this is um, because what I'm going to talk is about the the, the role of um, reinforcing events uh, in the um, sorry I'm having this uh, I don't know how to. How to, um, no, sorry. How to, no, no. How to move this uh, out from here? Okay, okay, I'll put it here. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so the, the way in which uh, reinforcing events acts, because traditionally it has been thought, this is the uh, traditional, the classic paper that you may know about the superstitious phenomenon by P.F. Skinner. And what he um, he did there was to put some pigeons in, in conditioning boxes and deliver food uh, intermittently. But the pigeons didn't have to do anything, uh, especially uh, specific for getting the food. However, food occurring on the intermittent basis or, uh, created or originated uh, patterns of behavior that were idiosyncratic, that were um, particular to each individual. That was uh, that what uh, Skinner claimed. And he interpreted that as then at that when reinforcement occurred, then the pigeons were doing specific behaviors. So they were by accident, they were reinforced. And then they were repeated in the future. So the, his explanation of reinforcement is this based on the animal is doing something and then reinforcement occurs. So a reinforcement occurs and acts backwards to a strength to reinforce what happened before. And, and that is the way in which he explained uh, the um, idiosyncratic behavior that each pigeon was performing. He observed that each pigeon was doing different things. And then he assumed that that was the way, that was the process by which uh, the pigeons uh, um, developed such uh, uh, behavior. Okay, this is an interpretation and this is, a, a, you can, and we are familiar with this interpretation in which we always have been thinking that reinforcing acts backwards. When reinforcement events acts backwards 
to strength, to a stamp, to associate, whatever term you want to know, to what happened before. And this is true also for Pavlovian condition, the classical models of Pavlovian conditioning, such as, for instance, Riscorla and Wagner model, is also centered on the role of the US. The US acts, and we can see if the US is unpredictable, uh, it is surprising. If it is new, surprising. And then if it is new, surprising, then it reinforces what, whatever CS comes, came before. So the idea is that um, the idea is that reinforcement and reinforcing events occurs uh, backwards, uh, strengthening whatever happened before, stimulus, responses, whatever. Uh, this was the, class, the classical interpretation of reinforcement. However, mm, sometime later, after this Skinner paper, uh, many years later, actually, uh, about 25 years later, or something, they came, uh, well, sorry, so I'm going to show you, uh, was, I'm going to show you how, how this, how this uh, works. This is the, this is the only figure that Skinner, uh, re um, uh, reported in uh, his paper, and it is uh, it is a very curious um, manipulation in which what he did was to uh, extinguish responses. So whatever whatever response was acquired, it was extinguished by not giving reinforcers, and then um, it delivered again reinforcers in the, in, uh, independently of behavior after behavior was extinguished. And by, by giving free reinforcers after extinction, then be, the behavior resume, as you can see in this cumulative record. So this is um, what we call today range statement. So by the free delivery of USs or free reinforcers, then behavior uh, reappears after extinction. He didn't call uh, this way that this phenomenon, but it is reported that way. And this is the way he claimed to demonstrate that this, this is because of these reinforcements that behavior originally uh, originally developed. Okay, um, this is, um, however, this, this way of thinking of reinforcement acting back, backwards is, um, is something strange. So we, we, we've been familiar with this, but it's some, there's something strange. And then I, I'm bringing this uh, piece of this film which is called Tenet. I, I, I'm going to see if I can put it in here. Okay, Tenet. I don't know if you have seen this by Christoph Nolan, in which he he put this in the context of uh, physical events or how physical events acting backwards look strange. Look strange. So let's see if you can see this. Mm -hmm. Empty. Amy. Magazine. Ah. One of these bullets is like us traveling forwards through time. The other one's going backwards. You can tell which is which. How about, no, it's inverted. This entropy runs backwards, so to our eyes, its movement is reversed. We think it's a type of inverse radiation triggered by nuclear fission. You didn't make it. No, I don't know. So where did it come from? Someone's manufacturing them in the future. They're streaming back at us. Try it. You have to have dropped it. I touch it. From your point of view, you caught it. But from the bullet's point of view, you dropped it. But cause comes before effect. No, that's just the way we see time. Well, what about free will? That bullet wouldn't have moved if you hadn't put your hand there. Either way we run the tape, you made it happen. Don't try to understand it. Feel it.
Interesting. Uh, why does it feel so strange? You know, shooting the bullet, catching it. Whoa. Uh, okay. <laughs> This is an, um, I'm, I'm trying to show you, this is an example of how weird sometimes we can feel that uh, if events are backwards, then it looks like uh, uh, difficult to understand. And that film, uh, for, for those of you who haven't seen it, is uh, there are some people in the film that is running through time forwards, and some people who are coming from the future and are coming backwards. So, and people interchange, some people are, going to in, time, it's in, the, in the process of a war, fighting against it. And then some people know what already has happened and, what, and other people know what is going to happen. And, and this is interesting because this is more or less the issue I want to bring you here. So what is the role of reinforcement? Is reinforcement acting always backwards or is reinforcement also acting forwards? And the idea of reinforcing acting forwards comes from this uh, old paper by Stalin and Simenhag, which is a key paper to the research I've been doing for many years, in which they were re-examining the, uh, the classic superstition experiment, superstitious experiment by Skinner. And what they did was simply put in the pigeons in the same situation as Skinner did. He put the pigeons uh, on an um, on intermittent schedules of food delivery. Sometimes pigeons had to pack a key, sometimes they didn't. And they recorded, they filmed it, what the pigeons did. They, they, they didn't do, they did the same uh, basic experiment as the Skinner, but they didn't, they, they were more um, precise in recording what pigeons were doing throughout the process. And, um, and instead, instead of just observing what the pigeons did at the end, they, they recorded all sessions and all moments within interfood intervals, and they reported what the pigeons were doing. And what they found is that the pigeons were, contrary to what Skinner found, is that all pigeons were doing the same or similar things. So that there was not each pigeon doing a specific behavior, but that all pigeons behaved similar. And then they reasoned that if all pigeons were doing the same, it is very unlikely that reinforcers occur in the first instance because the pigeons were doing such a thing. Because that would be very, very, very unlikely that all pigeons were doing the same thing when the first reinforcement occurred. So, so they brought an, an, an alternative interpretation to the superstitious experiment based on an evolutionary account in which they claim that reinforcers produced behaviors, produced variability in behavior, and reinforcing selects among those behaviors, those, be, those that variety of behaviors that are related to the to it, they select the, the more appropriate one to the situation. So that the reason that this is the reason why all pigeons were doing the same and not different things. And this is the debate: if reinforcement produces similarity in behavior, or if reinforcement produces variability in behavior. And this is the debate that you know that has been very extensive in the literature and uh, possibly uh, there's not a, 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 a single uneasy answer to that. Um, after Stadon and Simmer had classic experiment, uh, well, the, well this, is, this is for instance one, one of the figures they reported, these are different pigeons, pigeons, uh, the numbers, uh, they know the pigeon, 31, 47, 91, etc. And what they found is that this, and this is the, this is the recording of the behavior. Actually, they recorded the behavior just by filming the pigeons and then stopping the watch every second. And then they, they, they have a list of behaviors to observe. And they were just marking which of those behaviors the pigeon was doing at specific time, times within the, uh, interval, the interval. So this is the time between, this is zero, 12, means the time within uh, the food reinforcement schedule. So this is when food occurs, and at 12 will be another food occurring, and this cycle is repeating. As you, this is a fixed time schedule or a 
they call it an independent VI schedule, so a fixed a variable time schedule. And, uh, and, and then you, what you can see is that there are some behaviors that uh, occurred at a very low uh, rate of probability at the beginning of the interval and then increase, increase until the very end. Mm, so in the maximum at the very end of the interval, like this or this. As you can see, all pigeons have some behavior showing this characteristic, uh, notably behaviors R1, R2, R1, R2, R1, 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 R1. So there are certain behaviors, R1, 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 R2. All these behaviors, all pigeons do the same. As you can see, all pigeons show these behaviors in the same shape, uh, increasing as the time passes. And um, there are other behaviors, which are these other ones, in which they show a maximum in the, in the middle of the interval, and then decreases. They show in these inverted u say functions. And you can see that behavior, R3, R8, R6, R5, R8. R5. And you can see all pigeons have these other types of behaviors also. So they classify behaviors occurring in these two categories. Some behaviors increasing as time passes and some other behavior that increase and then decrease as time passes. And they reason that at the beginning of the interval, uh, they produce more variability on behavior, but at the end of the interval, there was a selection of behaviors related to uh, the reinforcing event. In this case, it was food. So these behaviors are two or one or seven are all behaviors uh, related to orientation to the food magazine or pecking around the magazine, or putting the uh, head into the food hopper, etc. So all our behaviors related to the obtention of food or the getting of food. However, all these other behaviors that occur in the middle were just uh, wine flapping or, or um, uh, I don't know how it's called, you know, they cleaning themselves or, or moving or looking into a um, uh, lateral wall, etc. But as you can see, what is important here is that there are these types of this classification of this distinction of these type, two types of behavior are exactly the same for all pigeons. And this is the basis for standard and similar claim that Skinner's theory of superstition was wrong. Um, and um, after this, it came this other paper, which is more less known, a little bit more obscure paper by a, a person called, what you maybe know, Evelyn Siegel. Evelyn Siegel was a, a, a well-known um, behavior analyst in the back in the 60s, the 70s of the 20th century. And she um, wrote this chapter for, wrote this chapter for this book called Reinforcement Behavior Analysis, in which she claimed that, uh, she claimed that the origin of the operant is an, as a property of the reinforcers that she called induction. So reinforcers produce induced behavior, and then that creates the opportunity for behavior to be in close proximity to reinforcement and then be uh, strengthened or be increased by reinforcement. So she introduced this term in, induction into the, into the operant literature and then started on himself um, uh, uh, took this uh, term of induction to explain the Stadon Simmer uh, uh, experiment. And um, what Stadon did was this model. This is back in 1977. What is this uh, recreation of the model? I, I did myself some years ago. But basically, what Stadon claimed is that this is time. This is how time goes from here to here. Coming through. Come on, uh, Sorry. Uh, okay. No, this is how time goes from here to here, and uh, as time passes, then the 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 standard claim that there is um um that uh, in the first part of the interval, when the, let's say when. It is a subjective probability, but also when the probability of the likelihood of, of a getting an X reinforcer is low, then animals develop what he called interim activities. Interim activities are those activities that they observe 
showing these inverted USA functions in which they go to a maximum in the middle of the interval, around the middle of the interval, or first half of the interval, and then decrease. As time passes, then uh, there is another behavior that occurs at the end, which I call this called terminal activities. These terminal activities are those that pick in the key, getting into the area of the food delivery, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and then there was a, there's a transition between interim and terminal activities. And he claimed that both interim and terminal activities are induced activities. So they are induced by the reinforcing event or by the, by the um, uh, yeah, the reinforcing event. The reinforcing event produced these behaviors, which uh, necessarily has to be linked to the reinforcer. So it has to be, has to have some relation with the reinforcer. You've delivered food, so that will be terminal activities will be those oriented towards getting or approaching to the food uh, area, and interim activities will be those related to um, dealing with other uh, other um, uh, areas of the box, but also behaviors related to the terminal one. And uh, if the interval is sufficiently long, they, they will there were all other types of behaviors here in the middle, he called facultative. But uh, Stanton claimed that these facultative behaviors are not induced. They are simply filling up, filling up the time when there is enough time to do other things. When he investigated this in the lab, uh, he was looking here, for instance, for activities such as attacking or um, uh, other things, uh, terminals approaching to the foot, and facultative behavior will be more locomotion, wind flapping, escape, uh, this type of, of other behaviors that occur in the middle. When you look these behaviors in the rat, which is the uh, animal we've been working in the lab, you will, you will see that if you get, if you, if you deliver food at the end of the interval, the animals will get uh, magazine approaches here, then as soon as they get the food, they will go into do interim activities such as drinking or, um, yeah, drinking is the most uh, well-known or they, they can also do other, other activities. And, and if there is enough time, they maybe go here and run on a wheel. So um, particular behaviors of this, of this uh, type of um, categories uh, can be identified. And then we can investigate the nature of those types of behavior, see if they are different, similar, or whatever. In the case of Stadon, what he claimed is that um, time, time acts as a discriminative stimulus, so that as time, as time passes, animals pass through different motivational states. First motivational state is called, what he called interim, in which is a motivational state that can be linked to stimuli associated with the absence of food or reinforcement. And then as time passes, then the, the, uh, the, there will be signals for food being almost ready to get again. And then they will go into this terminal, terminal motivational state. So well, this is more or less uh, his theory. Um, so this is uh, turning into our lab. This is, for instance, the conditioning boxes that we use. As you can see, they're kind of complex boxes. This is. Uh, Nice picture of a rat showing up here. Do not want to, normally rats like to be here because we give them food and we give them nice stuff in the box. And then as you can see here, they can drink from the bottle. They can get food, they have a, a magazine over there. With hopper. They can run on a wheel. Uh, we are putting out chains, they can, they can pull the chain. So the, we set the, the, the environment with different behaviors and we deliver food in terminal. Sorry, there is some there is some people talking about that. I don't know. Ah, okay. And then um, what we observe is behaviors like like I told you, they they drink into the uh, drinking water or drinking whatever solution we put into the into the bottle into the bottle, and this is an interim activity. Then they can run. This is a facultative activity in, in terms of a staton. Or they can go into the magazine, and this is a terminal activity. This, these three behaviors are the typical we have been measured for long now, uh, uh, and, and some others too. Uh, currently, we are getting into a, a project in which we are recording. We are recording the behavior continuously to see other behaviors. We see, and then we're trying to see we can uh, automatize that. So can, we can record that. Uh, with a um, 
system which uh, may may record different event different activities of the rat in the box but we we have not that implemented yet so we are measuring these discrete behaviors and um, and, and and a few a few more uh when we do that this is a, a recent publication uh with uh um, Gabriela Lopez Tolsa was part this was part of her PhD and we reported that uh, what is the temp what were the temporal distributions uh, of um, um, lever presses and leaks on different fixed interval schedules. This is fixed interval 15, 30 or 60 seconds. And, um, and what we obtained is that um, lever presses uh, show this typical scalp you can see. And it was uh, it was um, it was it was uh, an acceleration of responses towards towards uh, the maximum at the end of the interval. Towards the, so this is a typical fixed interval performance, and and and, and if you do big trials, then you can probably see a peak around the value of the interval and then a decrease later. Um, uh, however. Leaking, which is this distribution, this is how rats leak in fixed interval 15, 30, and 60. You can see that the, the leaking distribution more or less is exactly the same, regardless of the duration of the interval. So we claim here that um, drinking is not showing um, the um, this property of timing, the property of timing of, of a scalar timing, in which it will be proportional, the peak will be proportional to the length of the time. It is always fixed. However, in lever pressing, it is proportional to the time to the time of food delivery. And then this was a little bit uh, surprising to us because we were when we were doing this research, we were thinking of having a temporal regulation of all behaviors occurring within interfood intervals. And we found that some behaviors are temporarily regulated and others are not so clearly temporarily regulated. We are doing experiments now to test this because we have different hypotheses, different ideas of why this might be happening, but we don't have an answer, a definite answer yet. Uh, so this is a line of research, we are, but I, I want to show you this here just to show you how we are working into these temporal distributions and how these temporal distributions um, uh, need to be accounted by a, um, by a theory of, uh, of induction. Um, okay. We are doing also experiments like this one. This is more what we call the tennis project. This is a rather complex experiment. This is based on previous experiments on pigeons. We call it the Tenet project. And this is why I put you a part of the Tenet film, because what we are doing here is that uh, is signaling to the rats. The rats have two levers. And in each trial, only one of the levers is uh, delivering food. But, uh, but uh, the probability of being one or the other is random, so it can be it can be that um, that uh, food is signal with this light and that food is given here on the left, or food is given here on the right. So the the occurrence of these two trials this is random. So on each occasion, each trial starts and the computer decided which of these trials occur, and this can be a trial similar to the previous one. In this case, I mean, this is the previous one. So food was given on the left. If now food is given on the left, we call it trial XX. If food is given on the right, on the other, on the other lever, then we call it trial XY. And, and then we can signal, we can signal to the rat what lever is going to give the food. So in this case, we indicate the rat with this light, it is going to be given on the left, or this is going to be given on the right. If we signal the rats, if we signal the rats, which lever is going to be the one that is going to deliver food, the normal thing will be for rats to follow the signal. Okay, just to 
concentrate responding on the right level. And the, the interesting thing is when we, um, we um, signal not what is going to happen next, but what has happened last. And this, in this case, imagine this is the situation. We have give, given food to the right. And then now we signal that is going to be given to the right or signal that is going to be, or, or, or the signal to signal in the past, but is going to be given food on the left. So this is if, if trials are given the same food in the same location and in the past, is trial XX. If it's giving food on the opposite level than in the past, is trial XY. So in this case, the rat doesn't know where food is coming. It has to be guided by what, what it has happened in the past. And, and, and in, in, in this case, what is more reasonable to do for the rats? Uh, well, okay, and another important thing is that if it is a repeated, if it is a trial which is the same than the previous one, uh, then the uh, schedule of reinforcement is a BI 50 seconds. But if it is the opposite, it is a BI 5 seconds. So if it is changing the location of food, the probability of reinforcement is higher, much higher, 10 times higher. Um, and then in this case, if you, if you are signaling the past, because the rat is not knowing what is, go where, what is going to happen the next food, then, and then, then the most adaptive performance will be to change to go to the other level, try to see if you can get food there in five seconds. And if not, then change to the 50 second uh, uh, level. So there's, there's a different performance if you, if the rat is guided by the future or if it is guided by the past. And then what, what we want to investigate with this is that if signals can have this function, this function of signal in the past and signal in the future. And of course, we were successful in this. And this is more or less what rats, sorry, this is in Spanish, I couldn't change it. This is, uh, uh, if it is uh, if it is not, then, then they change to the other, the, 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 the non-reinforced uh, level. And then after five seconds, if not getting food, then decrease this and then, and then locate responses to the to the other level. Not not as high as uh, as we expected, but any, anyhow, it was a peak of responding by changing to the other level, and then returning to the to the longer level for the fifty seconds for the rest rest of the fifty seconds for the. However, if you are signaling the future, of course, there is no this peak. There is no this peak. Just simply the animals concentrate on the uh, level that is going to give the next food. So this is a project. This is a project that, uh, that um, together with other experiments, that shows that food uh, can have that reinforcers can have both those two functions. It's not surprising to to us, but nevertheless it needs to be proved that that reinforcers can signal what is coming next, or reinforcers can signal what has happened in in the past. Um, and indeed, uh, some people have claimed that the role of reinforcement by signaling the future is what is more important. This is an example of William Baum interpretation. And, uh, and this is why I'm going to concentrate now from now onwards into how we can explain induction and reinforcement uh, in um, actual terms. And, and, uh, and this is why I'm taking this William Baum theory because he, uh, he uh, interpret that all behavior is induced. There is no reinforcement. Reinforcement doesn't exist. A reinforcement is uh, the strengthening a reinforcing effect is, is um, a wrong concept about from him. And then he only claimed that all behavior is induced. And then what is happening in a situation is that you, del uh, you deliver, because he, he denies the use of reinforcement, he doesn't call a reinforcer event. He call it a, this uses this term, phylogenetically important event, but this is what we have been calling, and we still call it, uh, reinforcers. So reinforcers induce behavior. So PS, pi, uh, phylogenetically important events, induced phylogenetically important events related behaviors. And then if you repeat the occurrence of these uh, phylogenetically relevant events, then you produce more and more related behaviors. And this is why 
uh, if you, for instance, uh, 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 repeat the presentation of food intermittently, that you will you will generate an increase in uh, induction of behaviors related to those uh, phylogenetically important events. In the case of rats, um, being given food intermittently, one behavior that is um, induced and it is very predominant is drinking. So drink rats drink induced by the delivery of intermittent food. Um, and, and what uh, Baum claims is that by increasing these behaviors, by increasing the behavior, that there is a reduction in the other behaviors because all the time, time is limit and time is occupied by total behavior. So total behavior is a constant and then they have to be divided all activities between the uh, uh, all time on it has to be divided all activities in all the time available which is limited so the constant num the constant total activity has to be uh, has to be reduced if some other behaviors if any specific behaviors are increased so this is how he explains uh, the occurrence of induction and how induction competes how behavior which is related to a phylogenetically important competes with other behaviors that are not uh, so much related to the uh, phylogenetically important event uh, delivered at that time. And um, um, basically, we are, everybody more or less agree with this. Everybody more or less agree that that maybe there is a flow of behavior, and if we consider behavior as a in a in a very general concept, then we are always behaving. And then if we are always behaving, behaving, behavior, behavior can be conceptualized as a constant. And then and that constant, uh, that, that constant behavior should be um, uh, divided into different activities with the sum, the sum of all those activities will be given to the total. And if some behaviors increase, others, others should decrease. Um, of course, this is this is his interpretation. And then he came. He claims these these principles of reinforcement that you you may hear that allocation is the location of behavior induction and contingency. He later changed this term contingency. He's not using contingency anymore, but he's using more something more appropriate to his tradition, which is correlation or covariation. And um, and of course, if um, if a behavior if a behavior, one of these behaviors, and a peer co varies, then that increases. Okay, yeah. So that's more or less his explanation. And he then put a role of the reinforcers as discriminative stimuli. Discriminative stimuli, so reinforcers for bound are discriminative stimuli. Discriminative stimuli that elicits behavior. And these elicit behavior are the pi AI related behaviors. Mm. I think we we probably share many of it, but this this is uh, I mean in, in the in the in our hergon as you know this is what we call the molar approach the molar approach to behavior so it's a molar approach to behavior in the sense that it's only it only specify general rules on how overall behavior is related. This is an example. This is a a, develop, a, a, a normal. A, I would say a, a normal development from uh, bound approach throughout his uh, intellectual career, starting from the uh, very well famous law of effect. The law of effect is simply a relation between overall responses, overall reinforcements, and there is a certain uh, certain uh, linear relationship between those behaviors. This is the sense. So it's, it's a theory that simply accounts for overall behavior, total behavior. Total. If there is, if, if this behavior increases, if behavior A increases, then behavior B should decrease, and you know, establish some rules on how this happens. Um, what I want to convince you is that being this more or less acceptable, uh, it is not all. It cannot explain all aspects of induction. Not not all. Not only all aspects of induction, but not all aspects of reinforcement. Reinforcement has other other functions, and even induction is a different thing too. And then we were tr we try to complement this theory 
but uh, having different, uh, slightly different approaches, which um, which try to explain things like this. But this is a classic experiment by Roper, uh, 1978. I believe now that Javier is here. Javier worked with Roper many years ago. <laughs> and this experiment, this experiment actually is from many years ago too. But this is a very um, uh, well-known study in which um, uh, he observed he observed, uh, he recorded activities or uh, behaviors for rats on uh, on interfood intervals in this kind in this kind in this kind of a 60 second 60 second intervals, and then this is rats, not pigeons. This is rats, and then as uh, you can see, this this letter indicates different activities. This is entering into the magazine. This is drinking. This is activity. This is grooming. This is lever pressing. This tea. I don't know what exactly this. Maybe it's maybe it's getting into the tray, maybe getting into the magazine. So as you can see, he's reporting here the same sort of things that um, that Stadler and Simic had reported with the pigeons. Some behaviors occurred in the middle of the interval, increase and then decrease. So so in this kind of inverted functions, and some others like this T or this L increases uh, uh, as the time uh, goes by. So a, a, mo a molar theory like the one by Bond doesn't explain why behaviors occur here or here. Simply say that if drinking increases, then level pressing should decrease. But doesn't say anything about why drinking occurs first than level pressing, and why drinking shows this temporal function and level pressing shows the other. So you need some other rules, some other explanation to account for this, I would say more molecular aspects of how reinforcement acts. And this is this is why other theories are necessary. Um, one of the classic uh, theories that explains this location of behavior in time is this uh, familiar with Timberlake approach. Timberlake approach is a very interesting approach. I am very fan of Timberlake approach uh, because it's very biological. And um, probably my my uh, training on I studied on biological psychology, so this is probably tend to like these biological things. And, but but what Timberlake said is that when you set up um, 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 a motivation, this kind is uh, predation, so foraging, um, then you have different 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 stages in the process. When you when you are far from the from the catch, you have you have first animals have to general search for where to find a prey, and and then they travel. They socialize, they investigate. So between animals that uh, are, are, that catch up in groups, they socialize, investigate. So as the when they localize the the the, the prey, then 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 they go and 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 then do other behaviors like chase or chase or lie wait or and when they are just in contact with the with the catch. Then they capture, the test, or they, they 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 ingest it. So what they say, what what Timberley was saying here is that depending on the distance, the distance to the reinforcer, or to the goal, to, to to the end of the activity, then you do, will do different behaviors. So it's quite reasonable to think if you if you set up, for instance, Timberley did experiments like setting up very long CSS. And then seeing that animals are doing a specific behavior at the beginning of the CS, other behaviors at the middle of the CS, and other behaviors at the end of the CS. So if you are looking just for the for the last part of the behavior, for the behavior that is in connect in contact with the reinforcer, then you will only observe this. And then if you have a very long CS, you will see that this doesn't occur at the beginning. And this is why there were some interpretations of inhibition and stuff like that. But what, what Timberlake says is that the animal goes through a different array of behaviors depending on the distance between uh, where they are and the next location of the food, of the reinforcer, of the, in this case, of the, of the um, uh, 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 food they want to get. You, know, they, you, can, you can have this for predators, you can have it for birds too, you can have it for all animals. Or different behaviors. And this is trying to explain why is that organization of behavior 
on, uh, along the time. Uh, it is not very specific on how, how you will do transitions from one to the other. And this is why we developed some, this is a model which is already years passes. This is <laughs> almost 10 years ago, oh, 10 years ago, actually. And we did the model, I did the model with Peter Killeen to try to explain how these behaviors, how these behaviors interact uh, on an interval interval on on the in on the time in the time between reinforcers and uh, how some behaviors are dominant at the end some other behaviors are dominant in the middle like this are the curve and some other behaviors are dominant at the beginning so trying to explain so trying to explain the transition between one behavior will be called this should be a this may be b this may be c and then there's transition between different behaviors, and we predicted at specific times, these points, where this transition should be done, should be performed. So this is a theory that predicts um, a specific transitions and, and, uh, of behaviors and why some behaviors are dominant at the beginning, why some of the behaviors are dominant in the middle, and why some of the behaviors are dominant at the end. This is based on the likelihood of association between some responses and reinforcers. So I don't want, I don't have much time to get into details of this theory, but just to give you the flavor that we, what we try to do with this type of model is to specify rules by which we can explain why animals are doing the same things at the beginning of the interval, similar things at the beginning of the interval, other things in the middle of the interval, and other things at the end of the interval. Normally in experiments that we have done in the lab, we allow the rats to drink, run, and and eat, and then we always find that all animals do that in that sequence. First drink, then run, and then drink. Similar to what Roper reported. And this is exactly the same for all animals. They may drink, maybe drink more, run more, get into the magazine more, but the sequence is that. And this is um, an account of how this can be uh, occurring. Uh, something that is not explained by models by molar models such as those of of BAM. Mm. And then and then as you can see this model relies basically on reinforcement and bound model relies basically on induction. And what we are working now is on the um, trying to combine these two types of approaches. So possibly possibly it's not all reinforcement, strengthening I say not and not all is induction but maybe it's a combination of that. And we have some data to show that that, may, that is what may be happening. Uh, let's see how the... Um, so I'm going to, I, I have many data, I don't know. I'm going to show you at least this, ex, this experiment that we published some years ago, uh, shows exactly that, uh, or, or, or I think it shows exactly that. Uh, what we did here was to, program food according to a fixed time 90 seconds. This is a program, this is a schedule in which a single pellet of food occur every 90 seconds. Uh, the rat didn't have to do anything to get the food, simply it occurred, delivered one free food pellet every 90 seconds. But what happened is that if the, for some rats, if they lick 10, sec, 10 times, then this um, 90 seconds, reduced 20 seconds. So it, it went down to 70 seconds. If give another 10 licks, it get down to uh, 50 seconds. And if, um, and, uh, and so on. Um, so what we did was a, conti a, a, a contingency in which, in which they didn't have to lick, but if they lick, what they produce is an acceleration, a reduction uh, in the time to get the next food. So let's say by leaking, uh, you get um, a higher uh, frequency of reinforcement. According to a, a covariation theory, a, co a covariation theory, you should get that. You should get as you get more drinking and you get more, more food. So you get a higher rate of drinking, of leaking and a higher rate of uh, food delivery, then, then that's fine, there's a covariation. But what we found is that we found that we found out that uh, when we have this 
100% contingency, we got more drinking than if we have a yoke control, which is this white here. This, these animals were receiving food at the same time than this, but without, without the contingency operating. Um, so it's not the frequency of food that produced this, it's not simply induction, but there's also a contingency added here. Uh, and what is interesting is that you see, this is the temporal distributions that we reported there. Um, so this is the very first session, animals didn't drink at all. But on the very last session, you can see that here they gave food, they drink, and they gave, they gave food at the end of the interval. So they are drinking here, but the consequence of drinking and shorting the time is delayed. So they didn't move this location to a temper to a terminal location, but it, is, it kept kept here in an in an um, let's say in an interim location, even though a contingency was added. So possibly this means that this this leaking is induced by previous food, but it's also controlled by what is happening next. So it's controlled. So it's controlled by what is happening before because it's inducing this. But it's also controlled by what is happening next because the animals are having 100% control. They show higher drinking that the animals having 0% control. And, the, and there's an, another group here having 50% control, which is located in the middle of that. And this is the basis where we started to think back in the, after this paper, started to think that maybe we need the combination of two of the two things. Because we were unable, we were unable to shift these distributions toward more later positions in the uh, in the uh, interval interval. Well, we, well, uh, I, I simply have many other data. I, I, well, I'm going to see if I can go. Well, this, for instance, is an, this is an example of reinforcement. How we can we can increase uh, schedule induced drinking. By giving by shortening the food, this is uh, uh, the contrary example. This is how we can reduce leaking by delaying food. Uh, actually, this is a this is part of my PhD. So you can see it's an old PhD. I presented my PhD back in nineteen eighty seven, and this is this is an experiment of my there are a series of experiments from my PhD at that time. Uh, Derek Blackman was my supervisor. Uh, um, and, uh, and, and so we show it was possible to punish this by uh, by delaying food. So you can reduce it by introducing delays in food. You can accelerate it by increasing red, uh, shortening in foods. Um, and um, we, we can uh, and rats can acquire uh, drinking by simply uh, delivering food uh, delayed. So this is, uh, well, I'm not going to stop with details in this, but you can train animals to drink and then get food 13 seconds later, maybe 20 seconds later, 30 seconds later, and then they are quite leaking um, um, and so on and so forth. So our, our idea, so we have a, set, a series of experiments showing that we can, so we have a series of experiments showing that we can manipulate so that, that behavior that is in, induced is sensitive to consequences. It's sensitive to consequences in the sense that you can increase, you can decrease it by using reinforcement or punishment, uh, that you can um, change it depending on the motivational uh, uh, situation of the animals. And when animals are more hungry, they drink more. When they are less hungry, they drink less. They are motivated for food. Induction is higher, et cetera, et cetera. So there are many, many experiments. This is a lot of my uh, experiments that have been done in the past years. It's just to demonstrate similarities between uh, behavior that is induced and behavior that is, uh, that was regarded traditionally as an operant. So comparing, comparing in, um, um, induced behavior with uh, control behavior, let's say. A schedule control with the schedule induced behavior. So we are working now on this idea. This has been the idea of Killian and we and, and, a, and a more recent paper by Ruiz, uh, uh, Jorge Ruiz and Gaby Lopez and myself. And what we are thinking that what may be happening is something like this. 
maybe there is some uh, patterns of behavior that are pre-organized in the sense of uh, what Timberlake said. So there are some, depending on the uh, on the reinforcing events, some behaviors are likely because they are pre-organized. So normally when, when you give mammals food um, and, and, and you deliver them food, in, uh, when you eat food, you normally drink. So drinking is a behavior associated with eating, even though we, not, we, don't, we don't need to be necessarily thirsty. Um, or, um, or we move, we locomote, we displace to find out sources of food. Um, uh, or we approach signals of food, et cetera. So there are some, se several behaviors that we don't really need to learn. So we, that be organized. So what probably reinforcement is doing is selecting among those the most appropriate to the situation. So this is this triangle, which is similar to the triangle that was presented by Stadon, but turn it. Uh, so probably at the beginning of the interval, there's variability. And this is how interval passes, and then the probably selection. So we, we probably observe some uh, variability in behavior at the beginning of the interval, like in the case of rats, drinking, running. And as the interval passes, then you will get rats lever pressing or, or magazine entering at the end. And, and this, this idea of selection through as time passes is the um, um, the basis of what we think is happening, that they may be happening, um, the animals are learning some changing on behavior. So there may be animals are learning, uh, learning to change different behaviors because that way of automatizing behaviors and changing them more or less rigidly um, leads, to, leads to reinforcement. And this is why probably reinforcer is acting, acting both to the lever pressing and to the other behaviors too. And um, why possibly this, this, this chaining, this chaining is, um, is a sequence that, that unless you train it specifically is always produced in the same way, et cetera. So we think this is an idea. It might be interesting to push you. And we, this is what we are doing. Uh, for example, we are developing this model. This is a well, kind of complex mathematical model, but it is behavior. So it's a behavior too. So imagine this is leaking in the rats. Uh, it's a function of time, how, how much time to food delivers, but, but, but also a function of behavior one, which is behavior occurring after behavior two. So possibly behavior two depends not only on the duration of the interval, but on what behaviors are happening after it in a sort of chaining stuff. Um, and what is interesting is that this idea, this idea was more or less uh, proposed by Stadon and Simmerhart. If you remember this paper, I, I reviewed this paper at the beginning of the talk. Uh, this uh, Stadon and Simmerhart in 1971 were talking about the creation of these sequences of behavior through this kind of model, this mark of mod, mark of change. So they were they were not only recording behavior, but all, they recorded what the probability of transitions between one behavior and the next. And as you can see, these are the different parrots, the different pigeons, and how is the probability after full of doing behavior R5 or doing behavior R6, after doing behavior R6, what they're probably doing R7 or R5. Etc. So each pigeon, each pigeon has its, turn, its sequence, but for each pigeon, that sequence was learned, was reinforced in a way. And for some thing I don't know really, is Stadon didn't follow this line, and then Stadon turned into that other motivational account that I also briefly explained uh, before. But this idea was already there, and the probably this was an inspiration of this idea of chaining. And um, we have done experiment. This, this, this experiment is interesting. It was not very strong data, but it was showing what we were trying to, see, to we were trying to show, we were trying to, to demonstrate. Uh, this is an experiment in which we, we train animals on a fixed interval schedule. Fixed interval schedule. Uh, so fixed interval schedule means that um, 
they have to lever press to get food. Uh, as far as I remember, there was uh, this was a uh, uh, fixed interval, thirty seconds. Um, well, yeah, I think it was fixed interval, thirty seconds. But anyway, uh, and 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 then, and then after they have learned that, then we did the test in which uh, uh, also and, and also rats could drink. So they, what they what these rats were doing was drinking a, li, a certain amount of water, then lever press, and then getting food. And then on the test, this is this is a session of tests we did at the end of the train of the train. And we uh, put the rats in there on the boxes and we removed the lever. So some rats could drink, but didn't find the lever. There was no lever to press. So the schedule of reinforcement was changed from fixed interval to fixed time. And what happened is to those rats that didn't have the lever, uh, leaking, this is leaks per minute, rate of leaking, leaking decreased from about 30 seconds, 30 leaks per minute to less than 10 leaks per minute. And uh, as the trials uh, progressed, then this was increased. However, rats which had the lever, even though it was in inoperative, rats continued lever pressing, even though it was inoperative, but those rats leaking didn't change. So this brief and transient reduction in leaking may be due, to, that was our interpretation, may be due, but the rats were learn, learn a sequence of leaking, lever pressing food, leaking, lever pressing food, and then eventually they got, they went to a trial and when they found leaking, and then there was no lever pressing, and then there was that chain was disrupted, and then they have to learn again, uh, to drink and then get food straight away, or maybe do something in the middle. We, di we didn't record it. But, um, but um, that was the time it took to, to and this is about, uh, uh, it was a, a, not very persistent, but this, this is about, I believe this is uh, maybe a uh, few trials, few trials, I don't remember now, a few trials, uh, it was happening this. So it took it took some trials in order to to come back to the to the control uh, distribution of um, of uh, of leaking. Okay, um, <clears throat> by by using this this uh, equation, we are um, we are simulating um, and, and and fitting the equation to different data. For instance, this is a Fixed interval leaking. This is a fixed interval schedule, similar to the one I just mentioned, in which rats could leak and lever press. And you can see uh, the, 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 um, the dots are the real data, and the lines are the fitting of the of the, the fitting of the um, of the model. And um, and as you can see, the leaking is by bitonic function, bitonic function. And this is a different, dif different lengths of the fixed interval, 60, 30, 15 seconds. And, and this is level pressing on 15, 30, 60 seconds. And you can see there's a very nice fitting, uh, both for an, uh, leaking and uh, for level pressing. Um, we did the same for running and for a fixed time in which uh, animals enter into the magazine we recorded entering into the magazine and running on a wheel. And as you can see, uh, the distribution of running is again in, in, in the form, in the, in the U, inverted U safe function. Um, entering into the magazine is more accelerated towards the end. But the, the model did a good job. Well, possibly, possibly a little bit more dispersion in the running, but uh, did a very good, a very nice job in feeding data that we already have collected for it from already published experiments on running and entering. So we had leaking, running, lever pressing, magazine entering. Uh, so we think that, just to conclude, uh, we think that um, um, that possibly behavior is initially induced by the reinforcement. Um, then behavior is a strength or, yeah, maybe strength, let's say they call it like that, by reinforcement. Because mere, mere induction cannot deal with contingency effects unless with the temporal distribution, temporal location of behavior. That's very silent on how, 
how the subtleties of reinforcement, how, how reinforcement creates that, those most subtle changes. Um, behavior is organized on time as a sequence. This is the last bit, don't you? And possibly the occurrence of induction or reinforcement can accommodate the majority of these findings. Uh, we are actually trying to do experiments, which is a very, not very much in progress pro, uh, experiment. We, we have technical problems in which we want to reconciliate Skinner's and Stadon similar data. We think possibly both observations are correct, but they may be taken in different moments of the organization of behavior and time. We have some hypotheses on how this could be happening, but uh, we haven't done uh, yet on that. So, so it will be nice to, to, to close this research line to see an accommodation, not only for our data, but also for the classical data of the other people working uh, with pigeons. And that was the reason why I, res I recently was on a sabbatical on a study leaf on New Zealand in a laboratory by Sarah Cowie. And uh, because she's working on similar things, and she's working with pigeons, and we are working with rats, and we are trying to do a combination of a study with pigeons and rats to see if we can get something more general and uh, and give some information on how this may be happening. And just finally, I want to thank. This is uh, we've been grateful for the Spanish government to support our research, even though. Um, we are not in neuroscience. <laughs> we, we got we got support for the last more than thirty years now, and uh, and for the experimental analysis of behavior research group. We have the lab. This is a recent picture of the group we have this year. Uh, these people from many different countries. We have people from Mexico. Have people from different Latin American countries. From uh, and, and and people who have been more involved in this research. And these are these are students and staff members students from the degree of psychology, from the master's degree in psychology and for doctoral students. And you are welcome to visit us whenever, when, whenever you want. We have, we have a nice, nice group and uh, um, thank you so much for your attention. And this is my email in case you want to uh, send me some, uh, request some information or you want me to send you some uh, data or whatever. Yeah, happy to share with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, doctor. So we have some time for questions and answers. If yes. somebody has a question, you can. Um... Eduardo, do we just uh, jump in with questions? Do we raise hands or how do you want to do it? Well, now if you have a question, Federico, you can start. Okay, I'll, I'll just, sorry, let me start my video. Don't worry, don't worry, it's okay. Um, Ricardo, a very nice talk, I really, uh, really interesting. I just had just a, uh, just a couple of observations uh, or comments. I mean, well, in a request, uh, because uh, the, the fits of your model to the data is just uh, amazing. So I would, I, 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 I would like to look at it in a little bit more detail and see where it where it is wrong. Uh, okay, <laughs> because those fits are suspicious. I mean, no, maybe you're right. Maybe maybe yeah, yeah, okay. it's very good. But uh, I wonder first uh, is is have you published that that, that model? Is it available no, no, somewhere? No, no, okay, no, so no, I'll I'll no. just email you and ask you for for you no. know. Uh, uh, actually, actually, I have to I have to say that. Uh, the merit of the model, of this merit of the model, so I, I, I agree with you in that there is a very nice picture. So, so th there's a lot of parameters there, first, to say. Yeah. And, and, second, um, and second, this is done by um, a former student, which is um, uh, uh, a physic. Mm -hmm. So he, he likes modeling. <laughs> he likes parameters, too. He they, likes don't mind, they, they, don't like, they don't mind complex models. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Well, so uh, I'll ask you for that, and and so the uh, my my comment is about you said uh, you asked about uh, or you mentioned that Stadon uh, abandoned that you know Markov chain model that he was developing with you know from the superstition experiments, and I believe that if I recall correctly that the reason for that it's that it's 
it, it, the, the those transitions actually, at least from, he has another experiment with, I believe, airs, airs and, and stun mm -hmm. airs um, on, with rats. And at least on that one, I'm not sure with pigeons, but at least with rats, I'm pretty sure that one of the, the, the things that he showed is that actually those transitions don't have the Markov property. So that is that, that the probability of transition depends on what where the animal was before and what state it was before. So it makes it really complicated to think about these things in terms of Markov chains if part of the variability depends on kind of like the memory of the animal where it was before. I suspect that that was the reason why the Markov model was abandoned. But, you know, and I wonder if you have, you know, any thoughts about this. One way of solving that is if you think of this not as a Markov chain, but a, as a hidden Markov model, where you have the animal transitioning between states and the, and the behavior that you see is the behavior that's appropriate for that state. So it's very similar to what you're proposing. It's just saying that you don't see actually that the behavior is not the state, the behavior is an expression of a, an underlying state. And what you see is it's, it's a Markov chain, you know, or Markov transition with Markov property with no memory, anything like that, transition between the states. And the behavior that you see is actually just expression of whatever the, the environment affords the animal to do, given the state in which the animal is. If the, the, the environment affords the animal to drink, then the animal will drink. If the animal affords exploration, then the animal will engage in exploration. But the state is the same, the behavior may differ depending on, on what's there in the environment. That's all. Um, yeah, I, I don't, yeah, I remember that paper by Stadon, about Aries and Stadon or Stadon Aries, I don't remember. I think it was published in Animal Behavior, maybe. Uh, I don't remember uh, this uh, this discussion of of, uh, of the theory. I, you are probably right because this uh, there should be a reason why they didn't follow that line. Yeah, and maybe because in rats they found what you said. So, um, so yeah, and um, and the other question was, <laughs> sorry. No, the other comment. Well, well the, the, it's more like a comment of like thinking ah, about. No, 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 yeah, yeah, the states, the about states. this in terms of a hidden Markov model instead of like yeah, just the straight states, up. Yeah, you know. And the states, the states, yeah. And well, I think that uh, Stan was talking about the uh, motivational states and he was claiming that they were. Uh, however, we have some data. We have some data which are interesting because I didn't show it today, but we. With a specific uh, arrangements, you can move the behavior uh, that is specific to a, a particular location on the time between food, between reinforcement to another location. So you can shift it, for instance, drinking from an interim location to a terminal location. And uh, and if you do that, then it means that what you, you, you are not changing the motivational state because because the motivational state is running with time and then possibly rats uh, have learned that after a certain pass of time, they will get food. And, uh, uh, but you can change the behavior and locate it as, as a good terminal. Uh, we did that, for instance, in yeah, an experiment we did many, many years ago. We blocked the access to the, to the water bottle and just open the uh, access to the water bottle in the last part of the interval. And then they show like the terminal behavior. They didn't stop drinking. They could, I, I, what we reasoned there was that if Stadon was right, then possibly if we block the possibility of doing this behavior according to this state, then they should simply not do that behavior. However, they shifted and then we thought that there may be a reason why this is not linked behavior are not strictly linking to motivational states. Yeah. Thanks, Federico. Hi. Hi, Mauricio. Oh, nice to see you. <laughs> nice to see you. I apologize for coming in late because I happen to be in Spain where siesta is mandatory. So I just overslept. But you have to adjust, you have to adjust siesta to the timing. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I, I have, I have, uh, so I don't know whether you spoke uh, about the ideas that I had as I was listening to you, 
uh, whether you might have done the experiments. And, but I, I think if you're correct, I think of at least two ways in which you could, you could um, uh, break down the uh, induced portion of the behavior. One would be to extinguish level pressing in the absence of the, of the uh, water. Uh, the opportunity to drink from water, to extinguish the uh, level pressing and see whether that takes care of the that initial raise in, in uh, leaking. That's what one idea. And the second idea would be, and this, this I don't know whether it would work because these experiments require a lot of training, I think, right? A, lot, a very extensive amount of training. So maybe the behaviors, the, the chain that you talk about maybe becomes like a habitual, uh, outcome independent. But you could you could take uh, you could take the food and poison it you know associated that to uh, poison um, to devalue it and if you do that then you will have to see changes in the induced portion of the chain have you done any of this or what do you think about okay. this idea? Yeah, yeah, yeah. well I like your last, the first one I don't didn't understand what you what you were suggesting but the but the second one I understand because um, this is an experiment we did some time ago. Um, unfortunately, we haven't published it. Some, 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 those of the, that are newly there. And this was done by a student who came from, we did a collaboration with people from Oviedo who are working in these uh, uh, taste aversion procedures. Um, and our idea was exactly that. So if this behavior is controlled by the food, then by poisoning the food, just to get a reduction in drinking. And we got some, I, I believe we got some reduction, not very dramatic, but some reduction. So this it is sensitive to that. And we were thinking, we were doing the, some changes in order to see that was due to the habituation, to the habitual behavior. And, to, um, and uh, but there's some, there, there is some, there's some experiments I believe done by Boton and these people showing that even habitual behavior is sensitive to devaluation. I believe. Well, he showed that you can reinstate the uh, outcome dependency by doing a number of things. Yeah. 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 So we did we did we did that. Um we didn't follow that, but um this reminds me I have to take those data out from the so the first the first idea was. You just simply put the animal after you develop the the whole chain of responses. Yeah. You put the animal in the Skinner box. You take you take off the uh, you take out the um, the zipper tube, so the animal doesn't have access to water, right? Yeah. Okay. But it has access to the lever, and it can respond to the lever. And you and get food and get food. You get no food, so you extinguish lever pressing. If you extinguish okay. lever pressing. And then you, you test with the zipper tube, maybe even in the absence of food, or I don't know how you would test, but uh, you test uh, with drinking available again, and then you should see changes. If, if, what, if what you say but is you correct. Mean like a, you mean like kind of, kind of reinstatement effect, something like that? Yeah, it, it, it looks to me like you have, if you have a chain, it's analogous to a Pavlovian situation where you get like a, like second, um, like a higher order conditioning where you have a, a series of CSs, right? And the last one is paired with food and you get, you get changes to the initial CSs. If you extinguish one, the one, the, the one in the terminal position, you probably affect the, the uh, responding to the other one. Yeah, I understand. And um, I remember there are some papers showing, because this is interesting because um, this is why we thought that maybe Stadon was wrong in the sense that um, there's some experiments, I think it was done by Blackman, Blackman and some people in the UK many years ago, they they used um, a second order schedule. And and then and then they 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 conditioned it, uh, I believe it was a tone, maybe a tone as a conditioner of reinforcer. So then they argued, then they, they did test uh, giving just the second order reinforcer or the first order reinforcer. So they gave test of just giving them food or the signal. And they got induction only when food was delivered, was occurred. Uh, and they claim and they claim that on a second order schedule, the occurrence of the conditional reinforcer also signals a lower probability of food after that. So if it is just the 
signaling property of the reinforcer, it would be no difference between a second order and a first order reinforcer. And I don't know if this is in line, this is what you were thinking. Not exactly, but, but I can get your point, yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mauricio. Nice. Are you in Spain? Are you in Spain? Yes, I'm in Haiti. Ah, yes. ah, okay. Yeah. We did we did some experiment. Uh, we published. Um, we had difficulties in publishing this. But do you remember we did some experiment together too? <laughs> yes, I do. I still remember. <laughs> <laughs> I never. I, I haven't mentioned anything about that in this talk. It's in the interesting line, but I never mentioned. I didn't mention that. But we did some experiments also in Haiti with um, with Juan Marosas. On um, on renewal, renewal, and, and didn't didn't happen with these behaviors. It was not not a result that was I was fully fully happy with. But nevertheless, right. it was it is it is it is science. No? So we published well, it. That could probably imply that uh, this this chain is relatively once it is there, once it is acquired, it's relatively independent of the context. Yeah, maybe. yeah, so, sort of a context. Maybe, maybe you are right, maybe. yeah. Okay, we have to, yeah, we have to talk about that now, Risa. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good to see you. Good, Good to, to see you. you, all of you. <laughs> I haven't seen Javier Nieto in a long time. Yeah. And Federico. Nice to see you, Mauricio. <laughs> A good group of people here in this conference. This interview. Let's see. If we Ricardo, I, I I have a comment. Can I? Oh yes, please. Uh, when I was in England, I did some experiments with uh, Tim Roper that you mentioned, and one that we did was we varied uh, the body weight of groups of rats, 80, 90, 100%, which is non-deprived of food. And uh, they were in a fixed time schedule. I think it was 60 seconds. And what we found was that drinking, induced drinking, was controlled by the schedule, it decreased, but didn't move in the uh, interval. Okay. On the other hand, uh, behavior like grooming and the other activities uh, seem to be affected by the body weight. So that is one factor which uh, you mentioned, but I don't have the impression that you have done anything of, on that? You mean on, on, on food deprivation? Yes, very food deprivation. Yeah, yeah, we, we did, we did, we have, um, so this is a very long study. We did, uh, we manipulated food deprivation um, as a variable affecting punishment. When I started to, when, when the first experiments I did with this were, were on punishment. I did uh, my PhD, as I mentioned briefly, on, on, in Cardiff, in, in the UK. And, uh, and, um, and, uh, and from there, we did some studies in which we, uh, and from there, we, what we did was uh, some replications of some on how we could uh, reduce behavior, or so, uh, schedule induced drinking in this case, by delaying food. So we inserted, if the rats drink, they postpone food, and then we play with different things. We, we put it as signal food, signal delays, unsignal delays, resetting delays, non-resetting delays. So we did a combination of different, we, we put delays on acquisition, uh, delays, um, after acquisition or maintenance, so so forth. So we did a lot of experiments, but with that basic idea. So what we have that, the next, when I came back to Spain, um, we were doing experiments in which uh, we wanted to see which variables may affect the 
the, the may, may modulate the effect of the punishment. And then one of the variables was food level of uh, food depression, well, the, let's say motivation for food in rats. And then we did experiments manipulating the amount of food, so the, the, the incentive value of food, and also the, um, the uh, level of food deprivation. And, and what we observed is that the uh, punishment was less effective uh, as the animals were more hungry or they were more reinforced and more rewarded, let's say. They, they received more food. Uh, this is all we did. <laughs> Yeah, but this is an important variable. We cannot hear you. Yes, the, the thing where I was going is maybe the amount of behavior changes, but not the location of the sort of behavior that you are observing. We've done some experiments years back with amphetamines and uh, because we were trying to find something that will uh, reduce hunger. And what happened was that terminal behaviors uh, were more persistent and induced drinking mostly disappeared. And uh, so there is something there which might be of interest to you how motivational changes uh, uh, the structure of behavior or the amount of behavior, which is a different issue. So, okay. Thank you, Ramansi. Thank you for the comment. Yeah, nice. I think we have time for one more question. If somebody else have a question for Dr. Ricardo Pellon. You can raise your hand or just directly start speaking in your microphone. Uh, maybe. Um, um, okay. I stop. I stop. I stop uh, sharing my screen so I can see you better. <laughs> okay. Well. Um, I think we don't have more questions here on the um, in the chat. So, Dr. Ricardo, thank you so much for your time and for giving us an excellent lecture today. Thank you to you for the invitation. For yeah. Thank you, Doctor. Um, so, for everybody Hi. that is here, we want to say also thank you uh, for joining us today. We want you to go to our YouTube channel to check the other lectures we have from 2022. Also, you can visit our website from the Society, the International Society for Comparative Psychology. And also, please visit the website from our journal, the International Journal of Comparative Psychology. Our journal is a open access journal. Uh, no fee or charges uh, to read the papers and also to publish over there. So if you're interested, please visit our journal over there. So thank you very much to everybody. And we want to see you in the next lecture we have. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you. Thank you for organizing. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.